What up, Crossing family? It is so good to be with you. Uh, to those of you joining here at our physical locations or all across this region, I want to welcome you. To those of you who are part of our inside family, we're so incredibly thankful for you. And to those of you who are watching online, we are so incredibly thankful for you as well. Uh, some of you, you might not realize this, but our largest location doesn't have a location. It's the people who watch online. And this past week, a lady by the name of Julie reached out and sent our team uh, an email that reads, um, a year and a half ago, I got baptized, and I'm presently sick, and I've decided to stop my chemo treatments, and I have moved into hospice. I had to leave the crossing and move up to Wisconsin so my daughter can take care of me. I was listening to the sermon on abortion, and I've had two. Will I still be able to get into heaven? And what will heaven be like? I'm at peace with my decision, but I'm scared. And so we've been trying to reach you, call you, email you back, haven't got anything. So if you're Julie and you're watching online in Minnesota, I want you to know this. One, uh, you're forgiven. With the moment you decide to have an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, your sins were covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And when you stand in front of God in the judgment, uh, he will not see your sin, he will see the blood of his son. Second thing, check your email, because I sent you a sermon on heaven, and heaven is going to be awesome. And for those of you who are watching at all of our different locations, I want you to know, every single week, there are people sitting next to you, walking by you, whether you're a staff member, a difference maker, that there are people who are going through incredibly hard, painful seasons. And as a church, we want to minister really, really well in those moments. Today, we are at the conclusion of a five-week sermon series called Truth in Tension, balancing faith and love on hot topic issues. And let me begin by saying, I've been, so, I've been so incredibly proud of you for how you've handled yourself with class and compassion during this series. I called this sermon series Truth in Tension because that's really what we're doing. We're navigating the truth of how God's word says we're supposed to live and how we're supposed to love people in their particular situations. And some of you may not know my story, but let me give you just a little bit of it. I was 17. It was the Monday before the election where our country was going to determine whether or not George W. Bush or the guy who invented the internet became president. And I am one of those guys that if I get spun up about something, I'm kind of hard to slow down. I bet you guys can figure that one out. And I decided, uh, you know what? Maybe what I should do is I should spend my Monday evening going around and removing Al Gore signs out of people's yards. And then the next day, the people will walk out of their house and they'll go, someone cared enough to take this Al Gore sign out of my yard. I'll vote for George Bush. Yeah, it's a brilliant political strategy. You guys are like, this guy's onto something. And uh, that's what I did. The reason was because um, one candidate uh, had a different view on life in the womb than the other one. And, well, my, uh, my mom and dad had just recently had my youngest sister, Caitlin Grace. And she was 14 weeks premature, and they had spent three months uh, living basically in the University of Iowa's ICU unit, while because this was the early 90s, trying to make sure that my 14-week, you know, couple-pound sister made it. And they had just come back into uh, our house, and to call it a house was generous. And they had a quarter of a million dollars in medical bills that they were going to have to navigate, and we were already poor. Like, we were so poor, we couldn't pay attention, right? We were just not... Uh, for context, we lived in a veterinary clinic and slept on the floor in sleeping bags. I didn't have a bed that fit me until I got married, and I didn't have a bed until I was in seventh grade. So we just slept on the floor. And my parents just brought home this cute, gigantic medical bill and was in our home or our floor, whatever we had. That's where we were. And my dad's spiritual mentor called him and said, there's a young lady who is contemplating having an abortion 
But if we can find the child a great home, she won't. And so my parents broke with a kid that had just come back from uh, ICU, living in a three-bedroom house or room next to uh, on the vet clinic and sleeping on the floor, said yes. And I kind of like my brother. And I was going, man, I'm kind of glad that I know him, and I'm kind of glad that he got to live, and I would like other babies to have a chance to live. And so I spent my Monday going around picking up Al Gore signs out of people's yards. I had a driver. I mean, it was a system. I would get out, and I would walk down the block, and I would pick up all of the yard signs, and he would go around the block, and then he'd come back, we'd pop the trunk, and I'd put all the yard signs in the back of the Taurus, hop in the back, and we'd drive off to another part of town. We did this for a couple hours. I was pretty good at it. Uh, then a guy started chasing me. <sighs> okay. So, you know, this was high school Clayton. You can imagine how good he looked. And I just, uh, I ran away from him and hopped in my car, er, took off. Next thing we know, this guy's following us, honking his horn, shining his deer light off the side of his truck. I'm like, what kind of redneck is this? So we made a turn and kind of went through the ninth green of the country club and lost him, or so we thought. Uh, next thing we know, we're surrounded by cop cars. Guns pulled. And they had us get out of the car and sit down, and I got to sit in a mud puddle. And they asked us what we were doing. Turns out the guy who was following us wasn't some country redneck. He was a police officer. Um, so there was that. <clears throat> they asked us what we did, and we told them. They were a little confused. I said, pop the trunk. And they popped the trunk, and the trunk of this Ford Taurus was absolutely full of Al Gore yard signs. Uh, fun fact, every single one of those yard signs is more than a misdemeanor. It's kind of a big deal. And so I got arrested. And uh, yeah, then my, <clears throat> they called my parents to have me come get me, and my parents were like old school parents. We're like, you know, jail will teach you something, you know. <laughs> Obviously, we haven't been able to turn you around. They will, you know. <laughs> and, uh, but they said, no, you actually have to pick him up. And that's right, I became a political activist before I had ever even voted in an election. And then I got called in to the, the guy who was in charge of uh, dealing with my case, and uh, he asked me why I did what I did, and I told him the story. And he said, well, actually, I was uh, supposed to be aborted too, and somebody adopted me. And so all the charges were dropped. And so you can imagine... Me, with all of my right-wing ideologies, trying to figure out how to be a Christian around people who had completely different viewpoints, completely different stances, completely different upbringings. I bet you can imagine, some of you are like, ah, it's not so distant future, that I could be an awful lot to take in if I got ramped about an opinion or a subject matter. And then how that could affect somebody who maybe operates over here. Some of you know my wife's story and you're going, how did you guys get married? Well, it's because you have to navigate truth and tension. And here's what I've noticed. Maybe you've noticed this too. The closer you are to the sin and the person, the more you bend on the truth. And the further you are from the sin and the person, the harder you hit with the truth. Uh, let me explain. Your kid uh, gets punched at school. How do you handle it? Right? It's easy. Turn to the Bible. It tells you exactly what you, to do. You call the school. Call them a bunch of idiots. You address the teacher and tell her she needs to pay attention. And then you go and you beat that kid's parents up right in front of the kid. And you go, I will bloody your dad every time. We good? You learn? Yep. And then you won't have that problem again. It's fixed. Solved. Right? Because that kid is a bully and needs to be addressed and he obviously has bad parents. Right? You guys all know this. But what happens when your kid punches somebody at school? Well, you know, you find out what that kid d did to deserve getting punched. Am I right? That no matter what happens, the assumption is your kid did nothing wrong and their kid is trash. How many of you guys are on the same boat with me? Okay, the rest of you are liars. I'm glad you're here because we're a church for losers. But... Isn't that what happens? That because we're so close to our kid, we always interpret the situation as if our kid did what was right and holy 
and admirable before the Lord. But like, you're like, hold on a second, we know this kid, right? Like we know that our kid beats up his brother, like there's probably a chance he did hit somebody and he probably didn't deserve it. And that's actually what's happening in our world is people are seeing the exact same situation from two completely different perspectives. That's the problem. And so for the most part, we've reduced issues to talking points. We've tried to scream louder and louder and have assumed that other people see the situation the same way we see it. But the other side of these biblical issues are people who just don't see things the same way. For instance, we see a baby, and they see a clump of cells. That's why they say, my body, my choice. If what you see in the womb is a clump of cells and not a baby, it changes what you would be in favor of and how you would behave. They see it as part of their body. That's why their mantra is, my body, my choice. To those putting forward an LGB agenda, they cry out, love is love. And you and I both know that that statement is absurd. You would never go, what's a cheeseburger? Oh, a cheeseburger is a cheeseburger. Tells you nothing about a cheeseburger. You can't define the thing by defining it by the thing that defines it. You have to have other things, context that brings to bear. For instance, they are expressing that they want to be loved. Because there are obviously boundaries and appropriate expressions for love. Love cannot just be love. Hitting's not love. Lying's not love. Cheating's not love. What boundaries actually are supposed to exist? What they're probably crying out is not a definition of love, but crying out, will somebody love me? The issue for Christians, hear me, is not whether or not they deserve love, because they deserve to be loved because they were created by God and for God, and God sent his son to die on their behalf. It's not a matter of whether or not they deserve love, but what does that expression of love look like? And when you try to figure out how you're going to express love in these sticky situations, there's tension. Now, you guys know this. As Christians, we believe that God's way is the best way and has authority over our lives. But that's not necessarily true for other people. I mean, here's the standard for Christians. Let me walk you through it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Christians, flee from sexual immorality. Any sexual activity that happens outside of a husband and a wife inside of a marriage. We're supposed to run from it. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God? He's talking to Christians. That when you come into an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and he takes up residence in you. You don't belong to you. Pay attention to what it says. You are not your own. It's not your body. You don't get to do whatever you want with your body. It's not yours. You don't get to have sex with whoever you want to have sex with. It's not your body. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Someone recently said, for those of you who are church people, that if Jesus were here today, he would not encounter a rich young ruler who was unwilling to give up his wealth and follow Jesus. He would find nominal Christians who are unwilling to give up their sexual appetites to follow Jesus. That maybe the area where Christians shine the least is in the area of our sexuality. And when it comes to you and I trying to navigate this truth and tension, well, there's this. There's tension. Anytime you try to love God and love people. Have you ever felt that? That there's tension when you're going, well, I'm supposed to love God and lift up his commands and do what he says, but then there's these people I got to care about. Your, your kid decides to live in or move in with his girlfriend. How do you love God and love your kid? Your friend is cheating on their spouse. How do you love God and love your friend? Your brother or sister's running from God. How do you love God and love your brother or sister? Your daughter is pregnant in high school. How do you love God and love his people? 
And when it comes to navigating these sticky situations, I've noticed something, maybe you've noticed it too, that uh, sometimes Christians get it wrong. How many of you have ever seen a Christian get it wrong? <laughs> okay, you guys, those of you, oh, yeah, I, I brought the person who screws up the most with me. I got to, right? Some of you, some of you, maybe you're not a Christian uh, and you're kind of, you've been watching Christians for a while. You're just here to, you know, write a blog. Uh, you might be tempted to change it to this. Most times Christians get it wrong. They might be right. There's a story of a church not too far from here, uh, but the story's from a while back, who decided not to throw a uh, baby shower for a girl in their youth group who got pregnant while she was in high school. And I get it. I mean, what gets celebrated gets repeated. And you don't want a bunch of other high school girls uh, seeing like, man, all of the attention and all of the excitement around this girl who's obviously operated outside of bounds and because they might be tempted to follow in her footsteps. And we gotta uphold a high biblical standard. I get it. At the same time, the sin isn't that she's pregnant. The sin is that she was having sex before she got married. And actually, as a church, we're really thankful that she decided not to have an abortion and keep the, all the sin secret, but she decided to choose life. And now you have a family who's been surprised by a pregnancy, trying to figure out how to navigate the medical challenges, the, the financial challenges, and if there's ever going to be a place that's going to come around a young couple like that, and help them get everything they need in the room to properly take care of the child. Don't you think it should be the church? And if you're like me, you look at both of them and you go, there's tension. Because I can see validity in both approaches. And so if you're kind of going, I've been seeing the tension everywhere. And I think sometimes I've gotten it wrong. Hopefully at this point in the sermon series, you're asking the same question that I'm asking, which is this. How can I do it better? How can we navigate the tension better? Let me give you a couple tips. Uh, tip number one, sin is not the centerpiece of their identity. Sin is not the centerpiece of their identity. The centerpiece of their identity is that they were made in the image of God, that he made them on purpose for a purpose and sent his son on purpose to die on the cross on their behalf to redeem their sin. But their sin is not the centerpiece of their identity. Uh, some of you guys may have noticed that I'm bigger than most people. I, I went to see a, a lady up in Macomb and she said, boy, the camera adds uh, 50 pounds. I had no idea how many cam or 10 pounds. I had no idea how many cameras they actually had on you, okay? And, uh, and I, I get that, and I mean, and she, she used to enjoy coming to our church. Um, like, I'm not the most in-shape guy. I mean, I might have the most shapes of people at our church, but I'm not the most in-shape guy. I'm what I like to call Midwest skinny, okay? If I, if I lived on the coast, they would be trying to sign me up for treatments. They'd be like, we got to get this guy, you know, help, because he, he's dying. But here in the Midwest, I'm, I'm pretty good looking. I mean, I'm looking around. I'm Midwest skinny. Like, I'm, you know... I'm like an Illinois Brad Pitt, okay? Uh, because, and you know you're Midwest skinny if you just buy a bigger shirt and people come up to you and go, boy, you're looking great. Like you didn't have to do anything. You're just like, this is what a 5X looks like on me, okay? I'm joking, this is a six. And um, if all you ever did was come up and talk to me about, I can't believe you went to McDonald's again. Is that really where you've been eating? Do you think that's gonna turn me into going, I'm gonna eat more salads? Like, if all you ever do is talk to me about what I'm eating, I'm going to be like, uh, I don't think we're going to be friends at all, ever. Lose my number. I'm changing my number, right? If you drop off a salad, I'm just going to give it to the cow I keep, okay? Because I'm going to eat him, all of him, <laughs> right? I just, you know, that's why you give cows ranch dressing, because, boy, the flavor. Anyhow, <laughs> that's my cow called Hidden Valley. Um, if you, all you ever did was focus on my weight, I wouldn't let you have any level of authority in my life. And sometimes when it comes to one person's sin, as Christians, we can go, oh my goodness, there! It doesn't work. But second thing I'll tell you. Sinlessness is not a prerequisite 
for community. How many of you are friends with a person who's a sinner? Yeah. How many of you are married to a sinner? All the wives raised their hand, the husbands just sat on them. Like, I'm not, it's, it's still the weekend. You know, I haven't ruled anything out. But the wife's like, yeah, he's, oh my goodness, yeah. I was praying about it this morning. Okay? So here's what I'm saying. You have figured out how to navigate being in relationship with people who are sinners. And Satan wants you to buy into the script that when it comes to these issues, acceptance is affirmation. And every single one of us have become victims on this. Let me tell you what it looks like from my perspective. When a guy uh, who sleeps around at our church and serves in our parking lot ministry, um, when people see him, I don't get emails going, hey, are you guys okay with a guy who uh, sleeps around? I don't get any of those emails. You don't send them. You're like, oh yeah, obviously the guy, the church isn't a big fan of that. When a guy comes to our church and doesn't pay child support, I don't get emails going, hey, are you guys okay with deadbeat dads? I don't. I don't get those emails. Uh, However, if a person in a same-sex relationship comes to our church, you know what email I get? So is your church affirming? What do you do? I guess this is probably as good a time as any to address one of the most abused verses in Scripture when it comes to navigating this kind of tension. Here's what it is. Mark chapter 2. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? Now, don't raise your hand if you're a tax collector. We're super glad you guys are here. How many of you guys have heard people talk about Jesus eating with sinners? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hear me. They're exactly right. Jesus intentionally spent time with people who are outside of God's will. 100% accurate. So hear me clearly. Where would you rather have a person who is in an LGB lifestyle? Where would you rather have deadbeat dads, promiscuous women, liars, cheaters, and people who have had or are contemplating abortion? Do you know where I'd like them to hang out? The church. If I could pick a place for them to be, I would pick here with us in all our various locations. Sinlessness is not a prerequisite for community. If you see somebody at our church or a member on our staff hanging out with, eating with, interacting with somebody that you don't like or you don't agree with, ask yourself this question. Who would you rather them hang out with? Who would you rather them be talking to? However, hear me clearly. Jesus hung out with them but did not sin with them. He didn't help them sin. He didn't condone their sin. He didn't enable their sin. There are boundaries as Christians that we must adhere to. Jesus ate with them, but he didn't participate or approve of their sin. Read the next verse, Mark chapter 2, verse 17. On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. He's saying, yeah, I'm eating with sinners. They're sinners. What you're doing's wrong. It needs to change. I'm here to bring about a transformation in their life. I came here to minister to sinners and bring about a righteous reign of God and salvation in their lives. Here is what this would look like for me. I cannot drive you to the strip club, so don't call me. Right? I can't. But I could drive you home. Like, if you worked at a strip club, I can't take you to work. I could bring you home. I guess I probably should have reworded that. This illustration falls apart. Uh, the, next, the next line is, you can come to my house. You can eat my food. You can go golfing with me. You know, Clayton and his group of stripper golfers. We've just, God bless him. He eats with sinners, doesn't he? You know, all right. Uh, well, you get the idea. I can drive you home from an abortion clinic. I can't drive you to one. I can fight for homosexuals to be able to visit their, ho- their partner in a hospital because why does a marital status become a prerequisite for whether or not you can see somebody you love in the hospital? But I can never fight for your right to adopt or for your right to get married. If, if my kids had a live-in significant other, I can't pay for your hotel room on vacation. I can pay for your flights, and I can pay for all of your food. 
if you're gonna get married and you're in an LGB lifestyle, I can't attend your wedding, but I can definitely help you decorate your house, I can help you fix your roof, and I can make sure that Christmas is epic every single year. There are certain things as a Christian I can do and I can't do. I can love you and care for you, but I cannot enable or participate in sin. Hear me, Christians, you are bound by your relationship with Jesus to, bo- to show both love and compassion and give people community and at the same time not participate or enable their sin. You're allowed to have your beliefs and your standards and your principles too. Number three, sinlessness is not a prerequisite for kindness. We can be strong, but we must be kind. Sometimes, this is what I see happening in Christians and what I see happening in me. That we decide that we'll be nice after they repent. I just gotta ask you so, is that strategy working? I'll be nice to people once they agree with me. Husbands, has that ever worked? No. Couch is lumpy, isn't it? Right? Look at what, how Jesus interacts with us. Romans chapter 2. Or do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, forbearance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? Our kindness does not come after their agreement, after their life change, after their rejection of sinful behavior. It precedes it. That's how God moved in your life. So instead of this, instead of deciding, hey, I'm going to be nice to them after they repent, Here's how God worked in your life. God was kind to you first, and it led to your repentance. Those of you trying to navigate truth and tension, we may have got these flipped. Maybe we need to start focusing on being kind and allowing our kindness to lead them to repentance the same way God's kindness led to our repentance. Some of you during this sermon series, you've been tempted to think, because you've said some things around me and I've been paying attention, that your best path forward is this. Well, I'm just not going to bring that stuff up, (laughs) you know. Woo, I'm so glad we did this series that made me realize that I'm not having these conversations at all. I just need you to hear me say this. Uh, That's not loving, and that's not compassionate. That's not living in tension. That's abandoning it altogether. I've been bringing this verse up every time I talk, 1 Peter chapter 3. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. God's way is the best way. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. You're going to have to share the gospel. How else are people going to be saved? You're going to have to take a stand on truth. But do this with gentleness and respect. And Jesus is our model in this area. Look at what it says about Jesus in John chapter 1, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. That's Jesus. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. He's both. Being one or the other is not worthy of the cross. It's not worthy of Jesus. Christians should be known for their truth and be known for the grace. And the ability to manage both is a sign of spiritual maturity. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 4. Then we will no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves, and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful scheming. If you want to know, What verse, our chunk of verses describe our present cultural reality? It's this. People being blown around by evil schemes. But there's a mature way through it. Look what it says. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is, Christ. And right now you might be going, but Clayton, navigating this tension is going to be hard work. Yeah, being a Christian is so tough, you can't do it by yourself. That's why you need the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. What a sinful world needs right now is a spirit-filled, transformed life, a city on a hill, a lamp on a stand, carriers of the gospel message who are not ashamed of its power or its truth. It needs people full of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, or forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against such things, there is no law. Uh, Picture this with me. 
Uh, imagine you are getting ready to um, uh, watch a football game, and you went to your local hy V and got, uh, it's a long game, so you got like three dozen of their M&M cookies, right? And uh, you set those things down on your nightstand, and, or, but next to, you know, where, you, where you're going to pray. And you, um, you got a glass of milk, and you filled it up to the brim because you know that you're, you got 36 cookies to go through because you chose not to eat breakfast or lunch, so that way you could have them. And uh, you fill it to the brim, and then as you're walking by, your kid bumps you, and it starts to spill, right? What gets all over your hands and the carpet? Everybody say the answer on three. One, two, three. Why? Why does milk get everywhere? Why not, why not syrup? Why not pop? Because milk is what was in there. You want to know why jack wagon comes out of you when you get bumped in life? It's because you're full of jack wagon. You know why mean comes out of you when you get bumped? Because you're mean. Here's what you can do. When you get bumped in life, what comes out of you is what's in you. And so we need to be people who are constantly yielding the Holy Spirit. So when you and I get bumped by culture, when you and I get bumped by sinners, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are what come out. Let's keep going. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. It's no longer I who live, but he lives. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit, and let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. And we can feel the tension here between grace and truth, and truth and love. You and I, we can experience frustration and anxiety trying to figure out how to love God and love people. And the Bible says that this is the way we're supposed to treat people. This is how we're supposed to interact with them. And then we're also going, but I'm also told that I'm supposed to love people, and I'm supposed to love people, and they're in this sticky, sinful situation. And there is this constant, awkward tension. I'm going to have Zach and Rhett come up here real quick. Okay, give uh, Zach, and, Zach and Rhett a huge fan. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Come over here, Zach. All right, thank you. Okay, now here's the tough part. Um, this is Rhett. Some people confuse us, so I'm the one in the middle. Like, people think we're twins. We both. He works out for both of us, okay? So, there's this awkward tension. Some of you right now, you're sitting at our church, and you're going, all right, uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to be the truth Christian, and I'm just not going to be the grace guy. And I just want you to know, if you do that, you're not representing Christ well, and you're weak, and you're immature. And some of you are going to be going, all right, fine. I'm going to be the grace guy. I'm just going to be full of grace, super graceful. Just call me grace. And I want you to know, uh, and you're going, I don't want to be the truth person. I want you to know that that is immature, and it's weak, and you're not representing Christ well. Let me show you what happens when a church decides to uh, be one of these. So, Zach, I'm going to have you hold the rubber band right here. Yeah, perfect. Rhett, I'm going to have you hold that rubber band right there. Okay, stand right there. Okay, so you might be going, you know what, I, what I'm going to do? This is going to be great. I am just going to be all about uh, the grace and I'm just gonna, that's what I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be all about the grace. And you're like, man, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna be super full of grace. And every time, I'm just gonna love people where they're at all the time, and I'm never gonna stand for truth. And then uh, uh, you just like, I'm just gonna let go of the truth. So let go. Oh, and you know what that does? <laughs> yeah, that's real, isn't it? That's real. That hurts. That hurts. Okay, keep, hold up. Now, you know what happens when you decide to let go? What decides what happens when you decide to let go of the truth? You get hurt. And you hurt all the people around you. Now, let's just say, for giggles, yeah, yeah illustration purposes, <laughs> that you decided you were going to be just all about the truth. Like, God's word is God's word. And if he said it once, he does, that's all he needs to say it. And you're just, and then you're decide, hold on a second. I want you to, <laughs> the anchor holds. Okay, and you might be going, you know what, I, I don't care about your feelings, these are Bible facts. I mean, we are going to take a hard stand. <laughs> and you're like, I'm just going to let go of the grace. Let go. <gasps> okay, you guys can have a seat. It'll heal. Okay, God bless you. Some of you are going, man, I'm just, uh, I'm just not going to be a person who uh, is gracious. I'm just going to be full of truth. This is... What is the, that's what you are. You're weak and useless. And some of you are going, man, I, 
I'm just going to be full of grace. I'm just not really, it's not my place. I'm not going to talk to people about truth. It's weak and useless. And when you try to stand on one for a long time and then you let go of one or the other, you hurt yourself and you hurt others. Do you know where the power lies? The power lies in the tension. And guess what? You're already doing this. Let me prove it to you. How many of you, raise your hands, if you believe that Jesus was uh, fully God? How many of you believe that Jesus was fully human? Yeah, that's called a Christian belief. You know what? There's tension in that one. How many of you believe the Bible was written by God? And he used humans to do it. How many of you think God's sovereign? He's in control, super powerful. How many of you think we're still held uh, accountable for our decisions and we have human responsibility? We already live in the tension as Christians. It's baked into our belief system. And that's because there's power there. How many of you, at all of our different locations, you are a big fan of the cross? You're like, oh yeah, we should actually have some crosses around here. Right? Come here, pay attention. What does the cross scream? It screams that you're a sinner, but there's a savior. What does the cross scream? Oh, the cross screams that you're ruined, but there's a redeemer. The cross screams you're a murderer, but he's a messiah. The cross screams that there's this tension, that you've messed it up, but he makes all things new. That you deserve death, but he offers eternal life. That you're a failure, but God's not finished. You're done in, but God's not done. It is this very tension that makes Christians so powerful to a watching world. Don't run from it. Embrace it, because there's power in the cross, and there's power in the tension. We're moving to a time of decision. I said this at the very beginning of this series. I tipped my hand about how we were going to close it. We are trying to make this church, where you're at right now, a place that gives people time. They may not believe what we believe or behave the way we want them to behave. But here at The Crossing, we believe that there has to be a place that gives people time. That there has to be a place that gives people a place to take their biggest step of faith. And for some of you, their biggest step of faith is going to be completely different than yours, but just as big. And we're going to be a church that's rooting for them every single time someone chooses to trust God in any area of their life, including their sexuality. We're going to be a church that tells people that their failure is not final, and when God is in the picture, it's not over. Which means that on a regular basis, we are going to proclaim the truth that we failed and fallen short, but we're also going to proclaim that there is grace in the cross of Jesus Christ. We're going to be a church that is a place for lost causes, for people that others have shunned and shamed and given up on. That there has to be a place that still believes that Jesus changes people. Not me, not Jerry, not you, but God working through us brings about real life transformation. But there has to be a place that's willing to serve those in need, give people community, that there has to be a place that will sacrifice on their behalf and is willing to dig today so other people can drink tomorrow. We're trying to make this place that place. And it's going to take every single one of us to do it. I'm asking you to be confusing. Because that's what the cross is. The cross is confusing. It says you're jacked up. But I love you anyway. That as Christians, as we leave and go out into our families, we confuse them. Boy, they take such an incredibly hard stand on truth. And they don't compromise. But boy, nobody loves the way those Christians love. We need to confuse people by how we choose intentionally to live in the tension. And if you're here today and you want to be a part of that movement, 
that mission, and you've never started an intimate personal relationship with Jesus Christ, the life that I'm calling you to cannot be lived without the presence of the Holy Spirit. And you don't receive the Holy Spirit until you've been obedient in the area of baptism. And when you are being baptized, what you're saying is, is I want to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. Not just that he rescues me from my eternal destiny and my sin and creates a place for me in heaven, but I'm making him the Lord where I place him and his word in authority over my life. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And if you're here today and you're ready to make that decision, let me tell you, it is never too early to make the decision to follow Jesus. And in just a few moments, while the people around you stand and sing, and maybe some of them come up to the steps and pray, I'm going to encourage you to either take the person who brought you, or you can walk by yourself right over by the baptistry, and somebody on our team would love a chance to talk with you about what God's doing in you. To the rest of you, to those of you who call yourselves Christians, it's going to take every single one of us to make that place real. And you are going to need the Holy Spirit's help to live in the tension you're going to be tempted to go one way or the other. But with the Holy Spirit's help, we can stand right where the tension is the greatest and make the biggest impact. And I'm going to ask you, if your heart breaks to be that kind of church, to be that kind of Jesus follower, would you spend some time on your knees, whether it's up here or in your, over where your seat is, praying that God would use you, that his spirit would fill you up, and that you would listen to the spirit and do what he calls you to do. Would you stand with me? Heavenly Father, I'm asking you to do something special in this church. God, that we would become confusing to a watching world. That we wouldn't run to one side or the other, but we would embrace the tension. God, that we would lead and love and serve people that we don't agree with, people that we don't understand, with the hope that they'd find what we found in you. God, that you give us the courage and the strength to art articulate your life-giving gospel message, your truth. God, we want you to be proud when you look down and see this place by how we pursue you and trust you and worship you. So God, give us the strength to do that well. In your name I pray, amen.